Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. All righty, we are here. Hello, Jan. How are you? I'm good. It's so happy I feel to be like, here. I feel like I'm cheating with podcasts, just catching up with friends that I wanted to talk to anyway. So this is like a two for one deal. I know. This is awesome. This is such a great time. <laughs> and I was actually thinking about this this morning when I was driving home. Uh, it's a late night podcast, but I don't know whether I'm getting old or you just came at a young time because like you were one of my, f you were my second student at Champion. Like it was like, it was uh, uh, Keisha and then you. And now you're obviously yeah. practicing and like out in the world and like doing things. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm in like having you on the podcast and like, you know, speaking and stuff. I'm like, I don't know if it just means that like I'm getting up there or like we just happen to start young. <laughs> I don't know which of the two. <laughs> yeah, I think because I was like one of your earlier students, it's like I'll see, oh, there's one student and then there's the next student. And then it's like the shift community is growing and growing and yes. growing. I'm like, yeah. oh, it's going to be so big in a few more years. Yeah, that is definitely one of the cooler pieces too, is that I think we've had, I think I've, I should just kind of say, Cor uh, Courtney just started. So I've had um, seven like gymnastic specific students. So like former college gymnasts that are like fully through a doctoral rotation and want to like work in sports or take their boards or like OCS, SCS. And um, yeah, there's like this like little group uh, text thread, you know, one person, Je uh, Jen moved on to like an outpatient neuro, but everybody else is pretty much in gymnastics in some way, shape or form. So yeah, that's pretty cool to have like six or seven people that have all kind of come through. And um, this is so weird. Shelly just had coffee with uh, Aaliyah because they're both Aaliyah's doing an SES residency. And so they had coffee together oh. and took me a selfie. And they're like, we we like we met up with each other. I'm like, dude, this is wild. So <laughs> weird. Yeah. <laughs> I'm flattered, but very weird for me to be like the, the center hub of all this, you know? Right. Anywho, <laughs> enough about our gossip hour. <laughs> thanks, thanks for everyone who listened to the first minute of, of Jen and I's catch up time. We'll just FaceTime later. But um, so we wanted to have this podcast for uh, a couple of reasons. One is we get a lot of questions about overuse knee injuries. And I think a lot of people struggle with everything from Osgood slaughters to patellar tendon issues to my knee just hurts. And my doctor says it's patellar femoral joint syndrome, which I definitely want to talk about. Well, that's not a great term. Um, but I get a lot of questions, particularly around this part of the season when people are going to hear this. It's like, middle to you know beginning to middle of season and it's like whoa people are really struggling so that's one reason and two is because um, as we'll talk about at the end you're going to give a phenomenal lecture at a symposium coming up so it's a nice little lead-in to get people uh get people chewing on it a little bit you know what i mean so let's we'll start with um maybe just the bigger picture stuff which is you know as i said a lot of people struggle with it i had horrible patellar tendon issues when i was in um, college um but why do so many gymnasts have um, i guess knee problems that are that are frustrating um when I think about why overuse injuries are happening in gymnastics, um, I think it's easiest to kind of think about different categories of why it's happening. Like it's hard to boil it down to like one cause, like with anything, with any injury, but especially with overuse injuries, it's just, there's so many factors that go into it. So I think like the biggest thing to look at is like training workload. Mm. I mean, it's just an overuse injury. Like the definition is like an area of your body is overstressed to the point where it can't tolerate that load anymore. Mm. And no matter how much um, stretching, strengthening, movement training you do, if you don't change the overall workload, then you're not going to fix the problem. Right. Or you're not going to treat the source of the problem. Um, so just training workload in, in general, I think is a really big deal. Um, and I think it just boils down to four different categories. One training workload two, your gym culture. Mm. So, if, I mean, if your gym culture is we push, 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 you know, Oh coach, like my knee's bothering me. Well, like how bad is it? Do you yeah. like keep going or is it, you know, what's going on? Let's talk about this. Mm. Um, Third category of things I would say are gymnast specific factors. So that would be strength, mobility, motor control patterns in their movements like squats, deadlifts, landings. And then the last category is gymnast factors outside of the gym. So nutrition, um, recovery, and your support network, whether you have family that's communicating with you and you know, there's an open relationship saying like, I'm in pain when I'm in practice and it's carrying over to me being able to walk at school. Mm. Um, so I think the easiest way to look at it is just break it down into those four categories of training workload, gym culture, gymnast factors, and outside factors from the gymnast. 
Yeah, I love that. I think it's a very helpful kind of mental model to hold while we kind of walk through each of these things because, you know, the average person listening is probably a coach or a gymnast or a parent or a medical provider just seeing a lot of people there. And when somebody comes to you and says like, my knee really hurts when I vault or when I land on whatever, there's like 89 things going through your head probably of like what it possibly could be. So let's maybe just start and kind of dissect each of those one a little bit more because it kind of blends into the questions we had anyways. But um, so let's talk about workloads because I, I find, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but my experience is typically there's two big workload um, spikes that create knee injuries or knee overuse stuff. And one is going to be the preseason panic, which we're kind of past right now, but it's worth noting, which is, you know, summer skills are going on. You get to preseason, you start doing routines, you're like, oh, meets are coming, but we'll get there eventually. And then you look at the calendar, you're like, oh my God, my first meet's in a week or like in like four weeks, you're like I have a lot of routines to get done because I don't feel ready. So you just all of a sudden are doing like 15 more vaults and you're doing like 10 more beam routines. And you're doing a ton more hard landings on, on floor and you haven't really slowly planned out over eight weeks what that looks like, right? So that's the first one I see. The other one I see is right now, which is in the middle of season, which is you do your first meet, your second meet, and it wasn't great. You know, you're like, oh, I don't know if that went awesome or you're trying to add a new skill in. So you're trying to do a ton of extra volume of a certain skill to try to add it into your routine or to try to perfect your jumps, your leaps, your turns, or land that double back or land that like front tuck that you're trying to get to. So athletes will just do like a hundred of them in a 45 minute rotation. And that just whoo, spikes the workload like crazy. So, um, those are the two that I think about Are there other ones on your mind or no. Um, I think that's, those are two, the two things that I thought about also. I mean, like the, and the thing that stuck out to me when you were talking was like, oh my gosh, I'm not ready for season. And it's like, oh my gosh, I don't have my vault on the hard landing. And it's like, let's do a million onto the hard landing. And then Mm. it's like, well, I landed short on my first one. Oh, we'll get it on the next one. It's like, Mm. well, we don't have time for the drills. So, you know, let's go straight and, you know, you need to get this many numbers. And if you fall, then it's like, well, you still need to reach that number. So I think sometimes as a coach, we just don't realize, you know, the numbers add up. And so that's one thing with the training workload. Yeah, the assignment was 10 volts or, you know, five volts on hard landings. But how many attempts did we go through Mm. to get to the 10? Yeah, I love that. And I think that blends right into like the culture conversation, right? Which is the first thing you said, which is you're in the middle of meat season, right? And it's just, let's just take a souk, right? Your souk is just not really going well, or your chanko is not quite getting around and you don't have good block entry and you're landing short. And it's, it's, it's really causing your knees to hurt a ton, right? In that Mm -hmm. moment, the answer is not more your chankos and more souks, right? Like maybe for that day, it's like, we're going to shelf this. Maybe she's a bad day. Maybe we're tired. We'll come back in a couple of days. And if the vaults are flipping great, we're standing them up. It was just an awkward day no big deal. But if it's consistently a pattern where you're landing short or you're not getting turnover or you're really, really hard landings, the answer is in somewhere probably in a drill or a basic or a foundational issue or more sleep or like talking about fear. Like there's a, there's a conversation that has to be had there. And if the solution is just more and more and more of the same thing over and over and over again, and someone says, my knees are kind of sore and you're like, okay, it's fine. We'll get to it in a second. But like, we have a couple more to do. Like that is a minor communication and or culture uh, bug. You know what I mean? And I feel like that's that's the spark of a lot of these things. I think the key word is just communication. If the gym culture all comes back to how is the gymnast communicating with the coach? How is the coach communicating back to the gymnast? And how is the gymnast communicating back to their family member that's bringing them home? Um, and the person that eventually would schedule them an appointment with a medical provider. And mm-hmm. how is that parent communicating back to the coach? And then once the medical provider is involved, how are they a part of the picture? Mm. So I guess it's not just gym culture, but it's how once the medical provider gets involved, how are they um, facilitating the, the gymnasts to get back to what they need to do? Right. Yeah. And the other piece of culture that comes up to my mind, too, is kind of thinking about like the entire year versus just like what the next meet is or what's this weekend, right? Like in an ideal mm-hmm. world. Every gymnast would compete every meet all the time and never be limited by injury nor skills or mental blocks, right? Like that'd be a utopia, but like that is just not going to happen, right? People are going to have bumps and bruises that come up. And I think that, I feel like sometimes, and maybe you have this too, but people come to me in the clinic and I feel like I'm more just like a strategic consultant, right? Like I'm like, they're trying to figure out like, what meets can I do? And should I do four events or two? Cause my knees are really sore, but I want to make it to States or like, I literally just about someone today who was like, I'm trying to make it to Eastern's cause I have recruiting to go on. And like, 
you know, this other girl's trying to make it to nationals because they're big college looking at her. So it's like, you're trying, I'm trying to help them kind of play their cards. You know what I mean? Which is like, listen, I know you want to get a lot of reps under your belt before States, but do you have to do eight full meets before you get to States? Like, do you like this? One of these girls was qualified already from her first meet. I'm like, you have five meets between now and whatever that I don't know. If yeah. You have them. So I think that's really important for people to understand that, like having a plan and knowing that you don't have to do all 10 meets hardcore all the time. It's okay to take a weekend off or not do one that your whole team is doing. You know what I mean? And I think that's great. I think the fact that you called yourself, you called yourself a consultant, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. No, I think that's just the perfect word because think about yourself. You did college gymnastics. You're the physical therapist who's most specialized in this area. Like they're coming to you because they know, hey, you made it to college gymnastics. Maybe your pathway there wasn't ideal and mm -hmm. none of ours was. And that's kind of what motivated us to become physical therapists and make sure that this doesn't happen to other people. Yeah. Um, but it, it's like, they're just at a loss, especially with overuse injuries. It's like, what do I do? Like, I just want to be able to make it to Easterns or nationals. It's like, can you just give me the answers? And sometimes <laughs> you just have to like, almost pull it out of them. Like, well, if you keep pushing through this, do you really think you're gonna right. be able and healthy enough to make it to Easterns? And they're like, no. And so it's not like, you're the consultant, but it's our job to basically like ask those questions that will like, mm. they answer the question. So they're the person that's making the decision. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think that does kind of help us kind of understand. I mean, holistically is really what we're looking at, right? Which is like, yes, of course I want you to compete. I want you to be better, but like, I yeah. genuinely care about you for your entire career and I want you to have the best of it. And it's wild right now because Courtney is like one of the students who is at a champion as a physical therapy student. And I treated her when she was a sophomore in high school. Like I remember having that conversation with her it was like, listen, I know your ankle hurts a lot right now and you want to make it to Easterns, but like you have a recruiting year and then you have senior year and then you have four years of college. And then you have a life after that, like this meet that you think you have to compete everything at right now in the middle of the season is not like the end all be all, you know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. And you just need that reality check sometimes, um, mm -hmm. to kind of get your, your goals in line. Yeah, for sure. And so let's then transition to like, that's cool. It sounds, it makes sense, stuff like that. But when we talk about like the gymnastic specific factors, I think this is a good place to talk about like what kinds of injuries are we seeing the most, right? What kind of things are popping up that will help us kind of dictate around what we'll do for like some strength stuff or some, um, like you said, some, some different landing mechanics and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I think that overuse injuries, it's easiest to kind of categorize them based on the area and the knee. So like front of the knee, anterior, back of the knee, posterior, and then kind of thinking of medial and lateral. So like the inside and the outside of the knee, mm -hmm. most of our overuse injuries are um, on the anterior knee. So we think of our Osgood slaughters and our sending Larson Johansson, and both of those are traction apophysitis. So mm -hmm. it's pulling on the growth plate because their growth plates are still open. Yeah. So it's not something that adults will get. It's something that kids will get because their body's not fully developed and the demand that they're putting on their, their body is too much for them to handle. So it's their body's way of communicating saying, Hey, like we need to tone this down. We need to work on these things that are contributing to this pain. Yeah. Um, so I think Osgood Slaughter's um, SLJ are probably, well, Osgood Slaughter is probably the most common. Yeah. And then um, also another anterior knee condition is uh, patellar tendinopathy. Right. And that's something that, you know, isn't just in growing kids. Right. Like once their growth plates close, the patellar tendon withstands too much load that it can't handle. Um, and it's irritation of the tendon, mm. among other factors of, you know, if we go into Jill Cook's continuum of um, tendinopathy, but it's, we need to load the tendon appropriately. Mm. Um uh, do you have any other anterior knee, con uh, over not really. you the only one of? that I think is sneaky that I only know because of Lenny. And I think I would, I don't know, I guess I would consider obvious is like a fat pad syndrome, like a Hoffer syndrome, because I just think that yeah. like that, that is like, sometimes people do fall real hard or take one hard landing, but I think sometimes, and for those that are not familiar, there's a, there's a fat pad behind your kneecap that kind of cushions between your knee bone and back of your, your knee joint itself that is highly, highly sensitive and innervated to, to load and impact. And I think Scott Dye's crazy study where he probed his own fat pad and he said it was like super, super painful, whole different yeah. 
know why he did that. But um, I think like the fat pad is another one that I see a lot of people. Again, the thing, the thing that's interesting we'll come back to is like they all are caused by the same things. It's just like which area is the most predisposed. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And um, speaking of anterior knee, we didn't bring up telephoral pain syndrome. Yeah. Um, so you had brought that up at the beginning of the podcast, but that's also a really common one. Um, yeah. So I think later we'll kind of delve into maybe why some of those things are happening. Yeah, um, and I, I think we'll but, also talk about uh, why it's a terrible uh, nomer. You know what I mean? Why it's just like the not the, like the least helpful diagnosis of all time. It's like that that's the medical term for knee pain. If anybody wants PFJ, is you have knee pain. It's like awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, exactly. It's like where is my knee bothering me? When you ask the gymnast, they just point to their kneecap. You're like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's figure um, yeah. out why this is happening. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Um, I do, I do think that covers the majority of the front ones for overuse though. So yeah. So what other, what other areas do you want to touch on before we talk about factors? Um, I think we medial and lateral, um, you know, aren't as common. I think that, uh, gymnasts can develop like bone bruises, either mm -hmm. medial or laterally on the tibial plateau, yep. um, multiple hard landings over and over again. These are like things where, Oh, you know, it kind of hurts on the inside of my knee. But, you know, it gets better the next day and um, progressive landings and force on the area can contribute to injuries to the cartilage, which right. osteochondritis desiccans, which is a major injury. So if we can, yeah. you know, pick this up in the bone bruise stage, then we can prevent kids from having to get these surgeries to um, correct this. Right. Yeah. I would say like stress fractures and OCDs are like the very... Uh far into the curve of like it's just gone on for so long and you push through pain like those things don't happen by accident with like one accidental fall they're like multiple repetitions over and over and over and over so yeah that's the the unfortunate far end of the curve for sure exactly and another thing in that spectrum is just like chronic meniscus tears i mean right. like a uh, meniscus tear that happens at the same time as the bone bruise right um or stress fracture and like that micro tear kind of still irritates the the joint and all the structures around it and that's why they're having persist persistent pain um so i mean i would say that medial and lateral conditions are a little bit more rare compared to the mm -hmm. anterior overuse conditions but it's something that we definitely don't want to forget about yeah i would agree with that for sure and i think we can kind of go through some factors now but i think it's worth just like holding in your head that i don't know the more i see people i really think that we're seeing the exact same thing in a different sliver of a uh, shade of gray so to speak as they get older right when they're younger the most at vulnerable thing is the growth plate which is why like you said there's a traction apophysitis there's a growth plate injury of the slj which is the bottom of the kneecap the inferior pole or you have the tibial tuberosity or something like the only reason that that is the cranky area is because it's the least uh ready to handle force and so it becomes inflamed and irritated but as somebody matures and they grow older it becomes a patellar tendonitis it becomes a quad tendonitis it becomes a you know a, an excessive lateral pressure syndrome like a like a pfj type uh, subcategory or like you're saying uh you know uh, starts to become really bad in a stress fracture and then you get all the way up to the top end of advanced athletes that are in college or that are in the elite their bones are fused. Their, the growth plate is no longer the issue, but the high risk stuff is the cartilage and the meniscus, which has got so many years of getting beat up. So I think we see the exact same, you know, case in front of us when they're severs versus um, an Achilles tendonitis versus an Achilles rupture. And I think we see the same thing in the, the Osgood slaughter is becoming the patellar tendon or the PFJ becoming a stress fracture or a meniscus issue or cartilage. I think it's all just from the same factors personally, you know? Yeah. Did you have Osgood slaughters growing up? I didn't have Osgood slaughters. I had, um, oh man, I had the weirdest thing ever. I had like back of the kneecap pain. So I guess I maybe was starting to have retro patellar cartilage issues, I guess you would say. But when oh, I would, okay. land, yeah, when I would land, um, floor, uh, tumbling passes really low or under rotated when I was training double fronts, I felt like I was getting like ice picked in the back of the knee, but it was always negative. You know, it was no, no imaging was positive. Nothing ever. It's just like, you got knee pain. Stop gymnastics. And I was like, that's not helpful. <laughs> <laughs> and now that I look back on it though, actually it was like that I, the, the real problem for me was that I did like literally only body weight conditioning my entire life. Yeah. I never did any loaded conditioning at all. And then I did double backs, which were 15 to 18 times body weight. That was the problem. <laughs> exactly. And when you put it in perspective like that, it's like, uh, yeah, I should start picking up some dumbbells <laughs> and maybe eventually pick up some barbells once I get stronger, because that's a lot of force going through the knee. Yeah. And I think we can, we can chat maybe about that first factor first, which is the, I think the most plain obvious factor is like you said, workload, but workload is split into high forces, high repetitions, 
on young children. Like that's an equation, right? Like really high force is done many times on a young body that's not quite fully developed strength wise is, is a risk factor because it's just, it's just so much, you know what I mean? That's like the most obvious factor. Mm -hmm. And that's the easiest factor to modify during the training. Give a gymnast a good training program, say, giving them a, a max number of repetitions that they can do of landings and tell them they need to go on soft landings, see how their body responds to it, and then talk to them about it and say, you know, how's the plan been going? Like, have, has your knee started to feel better? Yeah, actually, it does feel a little bit better. Well, okay, now we can build you back up again. And yeah. it's a nice learning experience that they can remember for the rest of their lives because, you know, the PT is not always going. I mean, the PT is there if they need them, but they're not always, not always on site. And so if they're starting to have some pain um, or irritation in an area, okay, maybe I should tell my coach, can I do some soft landings today? Like this is kind of bothering me. Mm -hmm. And the coach should be willing to say, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, and it just kind of teaches them how they can take care of their own bodies. Um, and, you know, if that assignment's not appropriate for you that day, then it, the end goal is still in sight of you doing the best you can in your competitions and getting as far as you can, college gymnastics, whatever the goal is. But if your body can't do it that day, your body can't do it. Yeah. And I love so I think it all comes down to just modifying the training load. Yeah, I think I love specifically the the solution here that I really find useful is to give people like uh, kind of broad caps, right? Which is, you know, I want you to do when I was, co you know, when co when coaching, it's like I want you to do uh, seven fulls, but no more than ten, right? You have to do at least five, mm -hmm. but I want you to try to get seven really, really good ones. But if you get seven in a row that are feel really good, don't don't keep going. Like seven solid, right? But like it starts if you don't have an, a cap, it starts to become 10, 12, 15, 20, you know, they start doing a lot of layouts and a lot of drills and a lot of that. So with athletes that are having knee pain, if you modify for a couple of weeks and put them on soft surfaces, when they're going back into it, it's like, okay, what were the things that really hurt you? Here's a range to work in. And let's try to go with that. And even if you get to that end cap, you know, and you bomb five out of seven, it's, it's sorry, you know, we got to wait till tomorrow to try again. Yeah, definitely. Totally agree. And then kind of connected to this is going to be the strength side, right? Which I think is another big factor we already touched on with weights and dumbbells. But um, what do you think is the problem? I'm kind of leading the question, obviously. <laughs> I think I, we've had a show. <laughs> um, what, what kind of things are leading to uh, an imbalance there between the forces are high, but the, the knee can't tolerate those forces? Um, you mean in terms of strength? Yeah, for like, for, I would say like lower body strengthening work. Yeah, I mean, you want to have an equal strength um, strength between the front and the back of the knee, if we break it down simple to that. Yep. Um, so you want your quads to be equally as strong as your hamstrings because the hamstrings are preventing the anterior translation of the tibia mm. and vice versa with the quad. And you want your calf to be strong enough um, for all your jumping movements. And um, basically, the stronger that the muscles are around the knee, the better that the forces can be distributed throughout the knee. Right. And then we, we can get into the kinetic chain factors, but stronger sure. muscles allow better force distribution. Usually if you explain that to a gymnast in super simple terms, they say, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, right. And that goes kind of back to what we're saying, which is the landing forces are, you know, 12, 13, 15, 18 times body weight relative to the body mass of the athlete. So a 10 year old mm -hmm. experience is the same multiplier that a 18 year old experience is just relative to how much they're tumbling. So that being said, it's like, that's why. I think everyone is now realizing how important it is to like actually do goblet squats and lunges and skater squats with load in their hand, because when load is applied, yes, you're strengthening the quads, the hamstrings, whatever, but also you're putting load through the patellar tendon and through the joint, which is building up its capacity to handle really high forces, you know? Yeah, exactly. I'm glad that this strength training is catching on. I know it's been a long road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yes. And so on that note, so we have, okay, so we have, uh, workload, we talked about the top, we have some factors related to the actual planning of rotation of soft surfaces and stuff like that. We have lower body strength needs. And then we also, I think that connects to like landing patterns, right? Which is another big one. And can you talk a little bit about why maybe certain landing patterns have research has shown is like, eh, maybe not the best for the patellar tendon or the ACL risk. And then others are maybe more beneficial. Absolutely. Um, so research shows us that if in a more upright posture, it's more forced by the quad which is going to put more force into the knee. So the optimal amount of knee flexion is going to be um, about anywhere between 30 to 45 degrees of knee flexion, correct? 
mm. more closer towards 45 degrees of deflection. Um, so that allows the forces to be evenly distributed um, and it puts less of a force vector from the quad to create more um, joint forces. And so it allows your glutes and your quads to work together rather than more upright posture is a more quad dominant movement. Right. So I was, I was, I was slightly distracted because I want to show this, t this, uh, like epic, epically important meta analysis this is from Tim Hewitt. And this is probably mm -hmm. the one that I cite the most, which is essentially for those that are not familiar with research, the kind of like the gold standards of a randomized controlled trial. Then above that is called the meta analysis. So they take all the RCTs and synthesize the data and say, what is the best uh, recommendation? But Tim did a meta analysis of all of the available meta analyses. I think I said that right. <laughs> Menis guy um, <laughs> essentially was showing that if you combine a really good lower body leg strengthening program, and proper landing mechanics, like Jan was just saying. There, it says right here, the summary of meta-analysis shows an overall 50% reduction in the risk of ACL tears in athletes and a 67% reduction for non-contact ACL injuries in females. So obviously we're talking about overuse stuff, but the same factors that create ACL risk also create patellar tendon issues, Osgood slaughters. So this essentially sums up in saying that by getting really strong legs and using weights and using dumbbells and barbells and landing properly, we could possibly reduce the risk of knee injuries, traumatic knee injuries by 67% in, in young females. That's insane to me. I remember reading that stat and I was like, bro, 67% is bananas, which is why I'm such like a, a harper for strength training and such a harper for landing properly. You know what I mean? And I think it's like when you go to different gyms and you watch how gymnasts move and you're like, I mean, they have to be able to know how to land. And then you're like, jump off this box and land for me. Like you do a dismount and you watch them land and you're like, Ooh, okay. Yeah. This we we have some work that we need to do, and you're like, okay, I understand why a, a lot of gymnasts are getting injured here. Like, we need to train these proper landings, and they need to be strong enough in order to, like, do it properly. Right. Especially right. because there's a big difference between jump off this box and you know land properly versus mm -hmm. you're gonna do your double back dismount and you're gonna land on this really hard surface, and I want you to do it correctly. Yeah. So it's like yeah. building the gymnast up, but you need to do that by adding dumbbells and you need to have time that's structured during practice to work on those movement patterns and like a controlled environment. Exactly. Exactly. For sure. That last piece is so important in a controlled environment. You can't just ask someone to do a dismount and land properly. Right. And I think we're actually exactly. seeing a really good, we're seeing a really good change here because I know the judges I've, I've had long, very elaborate discussions with like literally all of the college judges and all the chairs, and they are so starting to understand the science of why this is important. So they're, they're changing deductions. That's slowly happening. The elite code coaches understand. So like, but the, the ACL risk is the biggest one and the meniscus tear is the biggest, but like these same things contribute to a lot of the, the overuse injuries that we're all talking about. And this is another great paper for the dorks out there like us. That's is the, the 2018 consensus statements on ACL ligament uh, injuries in like pediatric uh, athletes. And they have just so many phenomenal like uh, studies looking at what we're talking about, which is like the need to have a very good flexibility and strength program and why landing properly helps to deload some of the tissues of the knee. So for anybody who's looking for the deep dive or wants to bring a couple articles to maybe their friends who are a little less uh, optimistic about changing the strength program and changing their landing patterns, that might uh, give you some fuel for the fire. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. totally. yeah. So we have uh, all right, workloads. We have the um, factors related to uh, uh, reps and volume and soft surfaces. We have some leg strength. We have landing mechanics. Um, are there anything other like top of mind that you think are really important factors to mention before we, we help people with some some solutions? Um, I guess we, do we talk about mobility at all? Oh yeah. That one's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the knee is interesting because, uh, I think you had taught me this at one point, the knee is driven by hip and ankle function. Yeah. And that's also a fundamental that we learn in school, but the way that you phrased it like that was like, oh wow, that's really simple to understand. Yep. The knee is a very basic joint, but if you just treat the knee, I said the knee is a dumb yeah. joint, actually. <laughs> it's a dumb joint. Basic dumb. I don't know. <laughs> Seems like a nicer word. No, um, I just didn't. <laughs> so the knee is a dumb joint. So if you don't treat the, the ankle and the hip, you're going to have some problems. So I think the biggest thing is really addressing ankle mobility. I think mm -hmm. most gymnasts are pretty good with hip flexion mobility, mm -hmm. um, but it's ankle dorsiflexion that can be a big limitation. And if you don't screen it, you don't know that 
they're limited in Dorsey collection and if there's a difference from side to side. Mm. Um, so really identifying that and the easiest way that we can do that is with that weight bearing Dorsey flexion test that you use in so many of your training programs, 10 centimeters from the wall, making sure their, their big toe is lined up and they can touch their knee right to the wall in a lunge position. Yep. Easiest test, easy for coaches to do. If you see that a gymnast is having stru- trouble landing properly in some of the drills, you need to identify wh- whether it's a mobility restriction if it's a motor control issue or if it's both that way you're not just saying you know land like lighter do this do that if they have a mobility restriction their body is just going to continue to compensate but you're not going to get the end goal sure yeah and then above with that which is i think you had talked about earlier which is uh, most people have really good hip flexion mobility but it's a strength issue so I i see a lot of gymnasts who are not directly training their glutes or their hamstrings. We mentioned hamstrings, but you know, like single leg weighted hip lifts and proper deadlifting patterns are like insanely important, have great support research for EMG data behind glute max. And the glute max is a massive decelerator when you land. So if you're landing properly, you have to have a lot of uh, hip and, uh, you know, glute strength to help slow that down. And I think, you know, that summarizes like kind of like the entire thing, which is if you can, if you can manage your workload well, and you can rotate soft surfaces and have repetition counts, get very, very strong quads, hamstrings, glutes, and have good ankle mobility to absorb those forces. And then you land properly. Those things alone would dramatically reduce, um, you know, the, the, the risk of somebody, not the rate, but the risk of somebody having overuse knee issues. And then of course, culture and communication, if something happens, it always does, you know, you speak up and everyone's on board to be like, yep, this is a bummer, but we're going to deal with it head on. We're not going to ignore it. We're not going to sweep it under the rug. You know, like that alone, I think is a, phenomenally helpful starting point for a lot of people. Absolutely. And I think one factor that we're not looking at, or at least we haven't mentioned, but we always um, address in the clinic is pelvic control, Mm. making sure that gymnasts aren't living in an anterior pelvic tilt, which most of us do. And most of us don't learn at a young age. So at least I didn't understand it until PT school. I was Mm. like, oh, I'm living in an anterior pelvic tilt. Maybe that's why my back hurts. (laughs) 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 And my hip flexors are so tight. Yeah. So training gymnasts how to find pelvic neutral laying down on their back and then slowly getting them up into standing, teaching them how to find pelvic neutral there with a small core brace Mm. and then doing squats, single leg squats and going through the landing drills with good core control. Mm. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, you know, I think I would love to keep, you know, dancing on the theoretical, like how to prevent it and everyone stays healthy. But I think the reality is that, you know, many people are going to find this podcast and listen to this podcast because their knees hurt <laughs> or their daughters <laughs> hurt or, or their kids. Exactly. Hurt. So let's go on that road now, which is like, okay, we see a lot of people in the clinic who are early, you know, early stages of re- uh, rehab and they're diagnosed with Osgood slaughters, we've subdiagnosed them properly, not just knee pain, but we get them specific like patellar tendon issues or whatever. Really, what is the first um, step to helping reduce pain? And we did talk about modifying surfaces and I'll jump on that grenade, which is like, I'm sorry, but if you if you have knee pain that's bad enough to see somebody, you have to take time away from hard landings and impacts. Like that's just the most obvious. Like there's no way, no exercise that we give you or no program you find online will work if you're just gonna keep doing hard landing. So I'll say that one first, but in terms of practical steps to get out of pain, what do you feel is, is useful after that? Um, I think pain is just so complex. Um... I think first step is just modifying, like you said. Um, And do you mean like in the clinic? Do you mean in the gym? Yeah, I would say, let's just talk like holistic categories, right? So like, obviously we don't want to talk like rehab techniques or treatments because that's going to be the person. But yeah, generally speaking, I think I can think of like maybe like some soft tissue stuff and or some like, um, you know, minor stretching modalities, some like light isometrics possible. That's what my brain goes to. Yeah, totally. Um, I think just anywhere to get the body warmed up that way you can get prepared for, um, doing some stretching, doing some soft tissue, especially to the quads and gymnasts, um, their quads just get so tight and overworked from all of the jumping, um, landings, um, and our posterior chain. So our butt, our back, our hamstrings just aren't as strong as we would like. Um, just because gymnastics is such a quad dominant sport. Um, so soft tissue to the quads and then, um, going in with some static stretching. I love that couch stretch where, um, your back foot is up on the couch, tucking the tailbone under, um, just feeling a really nice stretch in the quads. Um, if as a rehab professional, you can do, um, uh, manual stretching mm. and then rolling right into some eccentrics. Mm. Um, so lengthening, lengthening and strengthening the muscle. 
starting with maybe some split squats or rear foot elevated split squats if the um, gymnast really understands um, that movement pattern well. Yep. And then rolling straight into things that I usually try to say less than a five out of 10. Yeah. You know, five out of 10 is right that moderate level of pain. I don't want your pain to increase, but unfortunately, this might be a little bit painful. It's not going to be completely pain free, mm. but um, we can do the best we can not to increase your pain and avoid um, sharp shooting pains. And usually I'll start with some table exercises, just kind of um, getting the posterior chain working with some bridges, starting double leg, if that feels okay, progressing them to single leg, um, and then figuring out ways if it's anterior knee pain and it's Osgood slaughters or patellar tendinopathy, utilizing some isometrics for the quad just yep. for pain relief. Um, and then from there, progressing them using uh, if it's patellar tendinopathy, using the Jill Cook's uh, model of the tendon stoplight system, which is pretty much the same thing I was using before. You might have a little bit of pain, but if it's over a five out of 10, you're in the red. So make sure that the pain doesn't increase during therapy, after therapy, the next day, if it's over a five. And so super basic things just to decrease pain in the beginning and then work the gymnast up from there. Um, so it's okay if a lot of the exercises are on the table and maybe when they're really flared up that you need to do a little bit more hands-on care, that's a perfect opportunity to establish rapport with, um, your gymnasts mm. and, you know, figure out what they like, figure out what's bothering them in gym and just create an open line of communication where they're not afraid to tell you what's going on with their life. Um, yep. And then once they're starting to get back to gym, get back to things because it's not as painful, then you guys are buddies and you've established that relationship. And yeah, absolutely. Gymnast is comfortable. For sure. Right. And that, like you said, that is the first step to like even getting someone to buy into producing load or like trying to do some sort of a plan, right? Is like they actually know that you care about them and that you want the long term thing what's best. And yeah, I would agree. I think, you know, after maybe two weeks of deloading and doing a lot of hands on soft tissue stuff and trying to get a lot of these things worked out, working ankle mobility while it's there, I think to your point, which is I, I think the, the sometimes the problem is we drastically reduce the load in the gym, but we also don't add back in things as, as intermediary steps with exercises before they go back to the gym. And so I think that's where maybe the role of like specific um, compound exercises do uh, come in. And I think for a lot of listeners, you can, you can kind of understand that there are certain lower body exercises that stress the knee more or stress the hip more. And sometimes you can start back in with the things that stress the hip more and kind of load the knee versus going back to like a goblet squat or like a really intense, you know, squatting variation. Um, I think other exercises are probably better to add first. So I personally think that like split squats and step ups and hip lifts are probably going to be tolerated a little bit more than say a goblet squat, right? Or some sort of like jumping squat you're going to do. So um, trying to maybe add those back in first. Are there other exercises that are like your go-to kind of first things you're trying to do when you do get someone who's like their pain is lower, but they have to get stronger. Are there other things that you really like? Um, I just love like any sort of deadlift variation. I think that you can definitely decrease the um, amount of knee flexion. So having a deadlift from a box yep, and just teaching them that hinging motion, starting with the uh, weight nice and light. And if they're doing double leg, then you can increase the weight significantly as long as it's difficult for them, but doesn't increase their pain. And it's kind of exciting for them because their knees been bothering them for so long, but look, I can lift this much. Like I'm going to be okay. And then slowly progressing that hinge motion to single leg and then adding in, um, increased range of motion. So deadlifting from the floor and adding more of squat movements with deeper knee flexion, uh, range of motion, but going through that too fast thinking that, you know, Oh, I, I want to have a well-rounded program of, they need to be lifting heavy for squats through the full range of motion. They need to be deadlifting through the full range of motion. I just don't think it's going to get you the goal that you want because their pain isn't going to go away. Right. Um, you have to modify uh, the forces that are going through the knee while continuing to get them super strong. Totally. Yeah. I think that's a great way to do it. Right. Which is you can still be in the gym. You can probably still do bars. You can probably still do a bunch of other low impact stuff, but we're not doing the hard, hard impacts, but you're also adding in the strengthening stuff that's going to prepare them for 
you know, the start of plyometric stuff, which is kind of where we're going to go next, which is, um, I think most people are a little bit intimidated by starting to get back to jumping and landing or doing plyos or doing like floor and vault. So what are some things that are maybe good, uh, starter points for people to kind of add in after the strength phase has happened? So maybe we're like two to four weeks in, we want to get back into skills. We want to get back into impact, but we don't want to go too hard. Yeah. Um, I think the best place to start is just with some pogo jumps in place. Um, maybe starting on the spring floor that way, like you're not trying it in the clinic or like on harder floor. Um, they can even put their sneakers on if they wanted to kind of absorb some of the forces or Mm. put, do it like on a sting mat, um, give them some numbers or do it for time. There's tons of ways that you can modify pogo jumps. You can do them in place. You can go from side to side. You can go forwards and back. You can do scissors. Um, you can do like small pogo jumps forwards. There's different ways that you can put force into the knee, just slowly introducing plyometric movements without going full out jumping or just saying, okay, you know, let's go back to tumbling. Yep. So I usually like to start with double leg pogos. Um, I'll try some uh, double leg jumping with, I can use a band as some assistance. So you can wrap a band on the top of a bar. They can hold on to it and it takes um, their a little bit of their body weight off. As they get more comfortable with that, you can do um, give them a percentage. So say, I don't want you to jump as high as you can. I want you to jump 25% of that. Right. Then they try that out and they're like, okay, I think that was 25. Then, okay, give me 50%. Okay, we're gonna keep here for today. Next time you come in, um, we'll bump it up to 100%. Once you have them jumping in place, then you can have them bounding forwards um, and then slowly you can add in from double leg to single leg. And then you can add in um, jumping up onto something, jumping down onto something. Mm. But if you can educate them and show them how you can do that progression, they're going to buy in right away. Mm. And every time they're succeeding at something, but you always have to set the gymnast up for success. If you're telling them that we're going to get back to plyometrics, you're going to start with these box jumps. The moment that they jump onto the box, what if they have pain? They've completely lost trust with you. Mm. You need to do something that they're going to say, I'm okay. I'm okay doing these pogo jumps. Yeah. And I think you, you, you dance on a very important, no pun intended. You dance in a very important line, which is like, you know, if you are too aggressive in a timeline, it's going to blow up in your face and you're going to, you're going to flare somebody up and also break that trust and rapport. So for those that are listening, right? Like, I mean, that's the first question they come to you is like, hi, my name's Jan. My knee hurts. When can I go back to gymnastics? Like, this is like the order of operations we get. So when you are talking right. to a person and establishing trust, what are some realistic timelines that people should be considering for like parents or coaches who are, you know, in a pretty flared up state? Is it, is it one week? Is it two weeks? Is it 10 weeks? Like what, what's the research maybe saying on like a realistic timeline to think about? I delved into the research a little bit about um, these overuse injuries, specifically like Osgood Schlatter's and Teller tendinopathy. Um, it's hard to find like a set timeline. Yeah. Um, yeah. Were you having the same issue? I, I know I, mean, I let you down a terrible rabbit hole because it's like really murky, but uh, <laughs> it's so murky. It's one of those situations where like it depends. Yeah. I'm going to say like if this athlete is so flared up that, you know, they're having trouble walking at school and doing their everyday activities, they're flared up. They need a yeah. huge decrease in workload and we need to build them up in therapy if they're just a little bit irritated okay, let's decrease your workload for a couple weeks. Let's build you back up over the next couple weeks and then we'll see how things are. But what I like to educate gymnasts and parents is rehab is a rocky road. It's not Mm. a path. We're going to have to do a little bit of trial and error and everybody's different. Yep. So um, this overuse injury didn't happen overnight. It's not like you sprained your ankle. Um, So we're going to have to figure out how we can change all these factors Um, and if you put the work in, I can get you to achieve your goals. Um, but there's no like set answer of like, you know, this amount of time, we're just going to have to see how it goes. Totally. And I think, you know, the reason I want to kind of go into that murkiness is because I think it circles all the way back to what and how important culture and communication is, right? Because if you have someone who, you know, their, their knees starting to bug them and, you know, gym are not the best about speaking about their pain, but say a week goes by and like, you know, I actually heard it last week started to do vaulting. It was sore. And I thought I could get through, I went to the meet and it was sore. And then, you know, it's Monday and I'm still pretty sore. That's only a week into the injury. If you deal with that right away and you reduce workload, you talk about management, you come to a provider, it could be a significantly condensed timeline, right? Versus like the, 
two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, someone's looking at a really gnarly flare up of like Osgood slaughters or they're limping around. Like you said, you know, I think, I think Tom Meadows taught me this and his rule of thumb is like two, two to three times for every amount you're off. So if you're off, if you're really out for two weeks, it will take four to six weeks to get back and vice versa. And I kind of like that, that rule of thumb. Um, and I also would highly recommend to people that you cannot measure in back to back to back to back days, right? Like these things take a lot of time where you have to load the tendon or load the knee and then back off for a day and see how somebody responds. Almost everybody has adrenaline when they work out and they have this kind of like excitement. They might not feel a lot of pain when they're working out, but the next day they wake up, they're like, oh my God, like, what did I do? I can't walk down the stairs, literally. So I feel like that's always important too, is these 40 hour windows before you change things is really important. Yeah, definitely. I completely agree with all that. Cool. And then I think, so if someone's getting back to some plyos, they're doing pretty good. They're kind of in the basics category, but they're say they're a little bit older, they're a little more advanced. They're kind of far and away from a Yurchenko full or a double pike or something like that, or a half and half it on bars. How do we then make that next big step up into load? Are there, is it, is it more advanced plyos? Like what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I think maybe we can break down the movement. So sure. if you're having trouble getting back to your chinkos. Our first step is jumping off the vault onto yep. soft landings. Then we change the landing to a hard landing. Um, we see how you respond to that, um, mm -hmm. especially with, you know, it's not just, I'm going to say, okay, do it once. Did that feel okay? Yeah. Like you're not just going to do one vault. Like I'm going to give you a bunch of numbers and that'll be your assignment for today. And then uh, you have a day off of that. And, um, then the next time that you come back to vault, maybe we could try a front flip or a back flip off the vault and land first on soft, then on hard. And then maybe just starting with, if you think of a Uchenko, it's not just the landing that we're worried about. We're worried about the sprint. We're worried about you hitting the vault where each factor is important. So that's stuff that we have to think about as rehab providers. And we need to tell the gymnast and educate them, them about this because yep. their end goal is just like, I just want to get back to doing Uchenkos, but you're not going to tell them just to go throw the Uchenko. You need to give them a stepwise progression. Sure. Right. And that so, step rise, yeah, that step rise progression can easily look like progressions of basics, right? The same basics that you yeah. would do. Like you said, it can be, uh, uh, it can be sprinting to a run through, then it can be a round off whip off a board. Then it can be a round off layout. Then it can be a standing back tuck. You can put the drills together and increase the load until you're just doing timers, you're doing tucks and then obviously work your way up a little bit. So yeah, I love that. That's really good. Um, well, this is very helpful and I don't want to drag on too much, but, um, before we kind of wrap things up, are there any other big kind of rocks that you think we missed? I don't want to make this a 13 hour episode <laughs> as we could. <laughs> totally. Um, I think we covered a lot of like really great things. I think with the knee, just we got to assess the kinetic chain. Yeah. Don't forget all those factors. Um, and I think all the examples we talked about is just another reason why people really need to find gymnastic specific uh, rehab providers mm. and physicians. Um, just because how are you, how is somebody that's not familiar with gymnastics going to be able to get you back? the best way that they can yeah. if they don't know what a Yurchenko is or they don't know the skills um, and they don't know these rehab progressions. So I think it just shows our value. Mm. Um, and hopefully all the listeners kind of see that if there is a gymnast with pain, they reach out to you to see, you know, is there another person in California? Is mm. there somebody here or there that you know and respect and has the training in gymnastics? Um, to be able to get my gymnast back um, yeah. to the competition floor. And I think that's where your community comes in so handy with all, all the coaches because in some of the forums they can ask like, hey, is there um, a physical therapist in this place? And then, you know, you reach out or they reach out in the in the chat room. So yeah. it's, cool. it's just great to have that community. Yeah, definitely. And, and the, when you said kinetic chain, the, the quote that I was stuck with was uh, I took my SFMA course and Greg Rose said, uh, if you, if you evaluate a knee and you only treat the knee, I'm going to find you and I'm going to beat you up. <laughs> That's, <when laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> He's so funny. He's just such a hilarious dude. But yeah, the way he presented it was like, just hilarious. Um, yeah, so that wraps up pretty well. And then I think uh, when this episode comes out, um, we will definitely have announced uh, the symposium, which I'm very excited to have you on the medical day for. So um, I'm pumped. Again, I don't know if that means that I'm old or uh, things are coming full circle. But um, can you chat a little bit about what, because this was obviously a big picture talk, but the day you're going to, is like a very specific medical day. So can you offer maybe some some insights into what you're going to chat about with like the medical side of the lecture for, for ATs and PTs and doctors? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that I'm going to delve more into each um, overuse knee injury a little bit more. I think today we had a great discussion on maybe 
some of the cultural things of why this is happening. But I want to delve more into what the research says in terms of management of each of these conditions, um, do a nice review of anatomy, and then give some really good case studies kind of going through each of these and how I would manage them in the clinic. That's fantastic. I can't wait selfishly to uh, cheat and learn from all the research that you're going to read. <laughs> so, <laughs> good, but um, Jan, thank you for the late night. I mean, it's late night for me or late ish night for you. So I know we're, we're busy people. So I appreciate you coming on and chatting and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see you at the symposium. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much.